Hi, this is Sandra Brown, author and audiobook fan. I hope you enjoyed No Rest for the Dead as much as I enjoyed contributing to it. I'm Andrew Gooley. I was one of the co-editors of No Rest for the Dead, and I'm here uh, talking with Sandra Brown about the whole project. So, Sandra, when I first contacted you and asked you to be a part of this, what were you thinking about the whole thing? Well, initially, I thought, oh, my gosh, they're really asking me to do this <laughs> because typically writing short is not what I do. And so the idea of writing just a chapter and having it kind of, you know, meld seamlessly with all of these other authors, there was that moment of blind panic. And then I thought, no, I think this will be fun. And not only that, I think it will be a great writing exercise and learning experience. So after my initial panic, I was very excited about the idea. And what excited you about the project? Well, having my name attached with so many gifted authors, for one thing. I mean, you look at this roster, and it's like a who's who of the bestseller list. So to even have my name in the company of these other writers was a tremendous honor. And then not only that, but because the whole project was going to be for a really good cause and the Leukemia Foundation, I thought that it was something important for me to do with my time, not merely from a career standpoint, but from a personal standpoint. I know, and you just took no coaxing. Just I sent you the email, and then I got an email back saying, I'd be very happy to be a part of it. <laughs> I wish more writers were nice like you. <laughs> oh, well, thank you. So how did you feel about writing something without character that you created? What is it a sort of an odd feeling of, of taking these people who other people had created and trying to be true to these characters, but at the same time, knowing that, my God, this is not something that originated from my pen or keyboard. How did that feel? Right. Well, it was it was definitely a different. It was definitely unique. And I can't really speak for my colleagues. Maybe they didn't find it as tricky as I did at first. But I must say that the authors who had written the chapters before really had already painted the characters, not just in broad strokes, but they had them fairly well defined in my mind. And the character sketches that we were provided kind of helped me know the people before I ever visited them on my own. And uh, I think the characters were well in place. I came early. My chapter, I believe, is Chapter 5. And so I came rather early. I felt a huge responsibility taking what had been done and developing the characters even further. And I would say it was tricky not exactly difficult, more challenging, and, and I kind of embrace challenges. <laughs> I kind of like that. When I'm asked to do something I've never done before and just kind of stretch myself, I thought it was interesting to take the characters and, and kind of flesh them out even a little bit more. You did a great job of that. Oh, uh, thank you. How do you feel the end project turned out after uh, reading and listening to it? Frankly, I was amazed. I did not believe that you could look at this list of authors and say, what in the world do I have in common with Jeffrey Deaver? What in the world, you know, does Faye Kellerman have in common with Philip Margolian? I mean, it was like I had read all these authors and I knew their work. I was well acquainted. But each author has such a distinctive voice, and that's why they're consistently on the bestseller list is because they have developed legions of fans. And those fans recognize their voice, and that's why they like them. I have to say, when I read the book, I was reading R.L. Stein and thinking, you know, I never knew he could write in this fashion. I mean, I always associate him with something totally different. And yet each author kind of took a backseat to their own voice. It's still there. But they took on the tone, the tenor of this project. And to me, it came across seamlessly. I was just amazed that we all blended so well. well that's good to hear. That's music to my ears. <laughs> <laughs> well, you did a great job. Thank you. It took four years of my life. So when I hear, when I hear contributors and readers are happy, I'm happy. I can imagine. 
So did you enjoy being part of the whole team at the end? Would you say that? What well, What are your opinions on on serial novels? Because we've had very very good uh, you know good feedback from all the other writers, mm -hmm. but sometimes with other serial novels, writers will say, oh, you know, this whole novel by committee thing isn't for me. How do you feel about that? Well, I don't know that I would want to do it all the time. I still like writing my book, my characters, developing my story, and breathing life into characters, as you mentioned earlier, that have come from my pen, that I've originated. But it was a welcome detraction from that. It was a, a little detour that I found very interesting. And so it wouldn't be something that I want to do on a regular basis. In all honesty, I don't know how I would have felt about it had I been writing one of the final chapters where everything had to be tied up. I think I was grateful for the fact that, in fact, I told my husband this the other day, <laughs> that I was grateful for the fact that my chapter came early in the book, in the volume, because I didn't have so many details to deal with and to tie up. And so my hat goes off to all of the authors who had to work, you know, really hard to bring everything together, and yet they did it so well. well I mean, the yeah. the yeah. twist came when they were supposed to, and the, the resolution was satisfying. Everything wasn't tied up in a nice pink little bow. There were still some ambiguities about Joe's future, and I thought that was great. I thought that was a very satisfying ending, so they did a terrific job. Thank you. The funny thing is the book was sort of written inside out, whereby there was the book two and the book three, and then after that we were looking at it and we said, you know what, let's have a book one. Let's have people care more about these characters. Mm -hmm. And then that's when you and Faye and Alexander McCall Smith did such a great job of flushing all the characters out and, and making them real. You know, and oh, to me well, that that's thank you. you guys did a great, great, great job. Because people that. wanted to know what happened to them. Exactly. Yeah. I remember yeah. when we when you called me up, you said this Christopher Thomas character needs killing. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's kind of a saying we have in Texas is what we needed, Kelly. <laughs> and uh, who is your favorite character, Sandra? Well, I think the policeman. I mean, we know so much about him. We know so much about his heartache and how haunted he was by the whole thing and his role in it. And I have to say the execution scene was just chilling. Certainly how it haunted him and affected every aspect of his life, personal and his career, and so I thought none was great. And I also, interesting, and I had to write about him, and it, it kind of carried through the entire novel how lousy the brother was. <laughs> he was just such a, a sleazoid um, that, and everyone who wrote about him seemed to really relish how rotten he was. <laughs> and, and at the memorial service, I mean, he just carried through the entire book is just a real, you know, creep. And so I thought he was fun. I always find the villains more fun to write about than the good guys. <laughs> <laughs> well, if we do a sequel, then you're going to be writing about the villains. <laughs> I'm, not gonna, I'm not going to saddle you again with writing about the hero and the good people of, of the book. So do you think there will be a sequel to this? Oh, gosh, I don't know. You mean picking up the character of the... Of, uh, or or uh, doing something else along those yeah, lines. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. I think the authors who did the uh, final chapters did such a beautiful job of pulling it all together. There may be some kind of spinoff with one of the other characters. This particular story, I thought, closed in a very satisfactory way. If I were writing it alone... I would have probably ended it there and left it alone. But then you're talking to the wrong person because I've never written series character. <laughs> so some of my colleagues, like Hattie Reichs, who write a series character, may see it entirely differently. I don't think in those terms. So you ask someone else, and they may have a totally different answer on that. Well, speaking for myself, I think I'm going into editing, uh, retirement, and, <laughs> you know, well, I think you've earned that. I think you've earned it. I burned out editing detoxification after this project. <laughs> well, you can sympathize with all the editors after work with a multitude <laughs> of authors, can't you? But you guys were great to work with. And so the audio book was number one on iTunes. 
That's just fabulous. Yeah, that that was just uh, was so happy to hear that, and it's a very the audio book production was was incredible. I mean, a lot of the characters when I was editing the book, and I even when I wrote a few chapters, I could you hear a voice of the certain characters speaking, and with this audio book, I had that same experience. Like Artie Ruby, I could hear how he was, and John Nunn, and Peter, and so on, so and Christopher Thomas. So they did a very very good job of that. So tell us about the importance of oral storytelling as far as uh, thrillers are concerned. Well, it kind of goes back to as far as there have been campfires, doesn't it? I mean, when I think of storytelling, I kind of associate, you know, with sitting around, you know, the campfire at, at Girl Scout camp or something, and, and someone invariably is going to tell the ghost story. And so I can understand why someone can get in their automobile, strike out, you know, for a journey, pop in a thriller. There's no way they're going to turn that off. <laughs> they're not going to leave, you know, the heroine dangling off a cliff. So I think it kind of goes back to that old, you know, campfire scenario where you're sitting around scaring each other silly by telling ghost stories, which are certainly thrillers. And so to me, it's just a natural blend. But I think, too, that the storyteller is very important. I'm glad we had a really good one for this audio book. We had several. Um, They were incredible. Yeah, and so many uh, voices to capture, you know, and that's not easy. So that was great that we told it in such a way I think it'll be as captivating to listen to as it was to read. Sandra, thanks for uh, chatting with me about No Rest for the Dead. Thanks again for writing a great chapter. I hope you have a great day. Thank you so much, Andrew. It was my pleasure.